Welcome to the show. This is Wednesday morning, and uh, forgive the change of scenery, the change of venue, but I had to watch the end of these hockey games, so if I look away a little bit, that's what I'm doing. Um, almost midnight here, and then so I, I needed to see the end of these these games. I've been really enjoying the NHL playoffs. Tampa Bay, the historically, statistically best team in NHL history, got swept by an eight seed who had never won a playoff series before tonight. Yeah, I think it is one of the craziest stories in all of sports in the past decade. The best team statistically in the history of hockey, 62 wins. They won 62 out of 82 games and lose, come out and lose to Columbus, and it wasn't even really close. Columbus beat them down from game one until game four. Um, game one was close, but then game five, uh, game two was, I think, five to one. And then today it was seven to three, two empty net goals, but it was still five to three. Um, they got a goal with about two minutes left, Columbus, to seal it, and then two empty netters. But uh, they, they dominated the game. I, I think if you had switched the jerseys, you would have thought, yeah, you know, that makes sense that that's Tampa Bay. What a bizarre series. I'm really, really enjoying the, the hockey playoffs. I don't watch much regular season. Um, I watch, the, I watch you know, 20 to 25 Stars games probably. Uh, not actively watching, but kind of in the background. But I don't watch um, much, much other. But I always enjoy the NHL playoffs. They always provide some drama. And this year is no different. So... Having said that, oh, Winnipeg just scored. Winnipeg just won an OT. Let's go. That's what I was hoping for. We're going to get a decisive game five back in Winnipeg. When in doubt, I usually cheer for the Canadian teams just because I know they care more than um, than the, the American teams. Uh, for the most part, anyway. I'm sure Boston cares probably about as much in Detroit, maybe. But... uh you know, I know St. Louis doesn't care about their hockey team as much as as much as Winnipeg. What else is there to do in Winnipeg? Anyways, tonight I'm just going to talk about briefly this disaster of a St. John's coaching search, which has become worse than the UCLA search, if that's even possible. It's become the biggest joke of this offseason. I'm going to briefly talk about Russell Wilson's payday, and finally... Going to finish up with breaking down the defensive line in the NFL draft. My best, my bust, and my sleeper. And uh, we'll, we'll call it there. I hope it is a wonderful Wednesday morning. I hope you're up and at them. And I hope that you are planning to have a great day because I am. So, first of all, this St. John's search. Porter Moser, the Loyola Chicago head coach, has decided to stay at Loyola Chicago Apparently, you know, they had, uh, they were about to offer Tim Clewis the job, uh, the head coach at Iona. This is his dream job. And they haven't done that. And now they're expecting to expand the search beyond the guys that they have now. And you're just sitting there wondering if Porter Moser, a guy who at his current job has accomplished more than, uh, more than he ever ever will again. He'll never get back to a final four with Loyola Chicago. That would be that would be absurd. If he won't even take your job with with really nothing left to gain at Loyola and, you know, salary, everything to gain by going to St. John's and potentially being successful. If he's not going to take your job, who is? I understand Tim Clewis is is older. He's um, you know, he he's not an amazing recruiter, but the guy has dominated um, with Iona. He took Iona to the tournament as an at-large. Sure, they were in the first four, but nonetheless, you take Iona to the tournament as an at-large, you are a good coach. So it's bizarre to me they haven't offered Tim Clewis this job. Apparently, they're opening it back up. I don't know who they're going to get at this point. I'm as lost as anyone. Man, when UCLA had these coaching search issues... I thought that was just a total farce and everyone should be fired. And now you look at what's going on with St. John's and this is a joke. I mean, 
to lose Mullins in the first place, and then who's you know had a mild amount of success, you are about to offer the job to Cluis, rip it away, offer it to Moser. He doesn't come. Now, do you go back to Cluis? He said he's still interested, but is that something they want, or are they trying to go a different direction? Can they get Mike Rhodes at VCU? Probably not. I wouldn't leave VCU to go to St. John's, especially after this mess that we're witnessing. Um, you know, Bryce Drew potentially is an option, but that would be... He's coming off uh, an unsuccessful stint at Vanderbilt. He's a good recruiter. I think he's a good coach, and and I think it, he it may have just been a little bit too early for him to get the Vanderbilt job. I think he, uh, you know, I don't think if he should have not taken it, but I think that that it was probably too early, and and I hope he gets another shot because I think he's a good coach. But if you're St. John's, do you dare offer this job to Bryce Drew, who just failed? miserably at Vanderbilt. I don't think you can do that. I mean, and outside of those two, Rick Pitino tweeted today telling him to give the job to Mark Jackson. Well, they just tried an NBA guy in Mullins. The Patrick Ewing experiment at Georgetown, we'll see how that turns out, but it's not looking great. Um, Penny Hardaway at Memphis, maybe, but those getting those NBA guys usually does not work out. And so I would be very hesitant to hire someone like Mark Jackson. It's it's a rough situation in the city right now because I, I I truly have no idea who they can get. If I were them, I'd go I'd offer Mike Rhodes a huge amount of money, but I don't think he's gonna come. I'd offer Bryce Drew after that. Obviously I'd take Cluis, but apparently they're they're uh, cooling on Cluis. I'm very confused by it all. Um, I guess we'll wait and see what happens, but this is the biggest dumpster fire of a coaching search uh, that I've seen this offseason, and I can't believe I'm saying that after what happened uh, with the UCLA stuff. So we'll see, but it's not looking good for St. John's right now. Um, Next up is Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson just got paid $35, I believe, million a year. $35 $35 million a year. I mean, there's not much more to say than that. It's the number alone should give you pause. And I made this point earlier today, and then, annoyingly, I heard Clay Travis on his show mention it. But what I was going to say is, with an NFL salary cap, like there is a point at which the quarterback is not worth it. I mean, there's a point at which you're better off just getting a stout, stout defense, a stout offensive line, and a good running back, and paying, you know, a cheap Ryan Fitzpatrick-style quarterback. Because, you know, I'm I'm not positive what the exactly what the cap number is, but say the cap numbers, you know, say you're you're paying your quarterback 25% of the cap. It's almost impossible to create and build a solid team, um, a really solid championship level team with the rest of that money. And I think that's where a lot of these quarterbacks go wrong is they demand these outrageous sums that I'm not saying these, these players aren't good. Russell Wilson's one of the best quarterbacks in the league, obviously, but does he want to win championships or does he just want to get paid? I think it's a fair question. Um, especially, you know, when you consider what I just said, there's a salary cap and these guys are demanding so much money that it's almost impossible to build a decent team around them. So, you know, obviously, obviously it helps to have a great quarterback. We all know that. I mean, you just look at the teams that were in the the championship games this year. Jared Goff wasn't great. But with Sean McVay and the tools around him, it made Jared Goff way better than he actually is. So I think that teams are going to start getting more creative in how they pay these quarterbacks and how they structure their team. You're seeing people like Dallas Keuchel and Bryce Harper. Dallas Keuchel hadn't even been signed yet in in the big leagues. Uh, Bryce Harper took forever to get a deal. All these guys are signing extensions because they're seeing this free agent market dry up and people not want to pay them money. And I think you're going to see the same thing from quarterbacks. I think 
as we go forward, people aren't going to want to pay these exorbitant amounts to these quarterbacks, and quarterbacks are going to end up either signing extensions for less or hitting the free agent market and see those markets dry up. Because at some point, as a franchise, you have to adjust your your scheme and and start building a team that isn't necessarily quarterback focused. And I'm not saying that's an easy way to win a championship. It's it's probably harder. Um, but uh, I don't want to say harder. Even it's it's definitely very difficult to win a championship that way. But you saw the Ravens do it um, back in the early 2000s. You almost saw the Bears do it with Rex Grossman. So it's not impossible. We know that. I mean, Joe Flacco's won a Super Bowl, so we know that it's possible to have a, a perfectly adequate quarterback and win a Super Bowl. And I think you're going to start to see that more and more. Finally, defensive line for the NFL draft. Do this quickly. My best, my bust, and my sleeper. My best, I have to say Nick Bosa. Um, you know, I know he, he, he didn't play the second half of the year for Ohio State, but he's really, really good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Joey Bosa's had a, a solid couple years with the Chargers. So, you know, he kind of has that pedigree to come along and say, look, you know, I'm as good or better. He's, I think he's probably better than Joey. You know, I'm, I'm as good as or better than my brother. And so, you know, I deserve the money that, that you're fixing to pay me. Um, so I, it's hard not to say Nick Bosa is number one. Uh, my bust is actually the guy who's ranked number two right now on the, the defensive line is uh, Josh Allen of Kentucky. I watched him play last year against A&M. And uh, I, don't know, I watched him play a lot of games, the Georgia game. Good player. You know, I don't want to say he's a bust. That might be a little much, but I think he is far vastly overrated, and I don't think he's going to be that good. I think that, you know, when you look back and say, you know, they do the redrafts, I think he, it, when they redraft this in five years, he'll probably go in the fourth round. Um, I think he's very overrated. I don't think his he's fast, but I don't think he has enough speed to make up for what he lacks in strength and and um and size so i think josh allen's gonna be an average at best uh edge rusher and finally um my sleeper is a d d tackle kind of potential uh probably d tackle i he's probably too big to put him at a at a uh three four d in spot but ed alexander from lsu i know he's he's way down he might even go undrafted <laughs> but but he he's a good player uh, he's, he, he was pretty solid at LSU. He's huge. You know, he's, he go he's 300 plus, um, and he can plug up gaps there in the middle. So I think that again, when they redraft this in a few years, he'll be that fourth, fifth round guy that somebody got in the seventh round or undrafted. Uh, that's just a, a solid guy there in the middle of, of a three, four scheme or, you know, alongside somebody else in a 4-3. In a um, I think Ed Alexander is going to be a perfectly decent player. We'll see. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday. Sorry I went over just a little bit. Um, hope you have a wonderful Wednesday. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when this is live every morning at 6 a.m. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful Wednesday. See you all tomorrow.